Hey there! Welcome back to another episode of A View from Earth, the official podcast of the Fisk Planetarium here at CU Boulder. Uh, my name is Colin Sinclair, as always. I'm an undergrad at CU, and I work at the Planetarium as a presenter when the building is open, and when it's not, I co-host this podcast with Tara Tomlinson. Hey, Tara. Hey, Colin. <laughs> as always, I am Tara, and I'm a uh, CU alum and planetary scientist and presenter at Fisk as well, and coordinate the outreach program and all that fun stuff, whether the building is open or not. Woohoo! <laughs> Yeah, that's a good distinction. Maybe I shouldn't say uh, only when the building is closed do I do other things and such. Anywho, we're also joined by John, our producer. Hey, John. Hello. <laughs> cool. Well, today we're going to talk about uh, empowering youth through performance, uh, specifically in the area of climate science with uh, Dr. Beth Osnes, uh, who is a researcher uh, and professor with uh, CU Boulder, both in uh, environmental studies and in uh, theater and dance. And so um, it's a really cool conversation. It's kind of, uh, it's a little bit different than what we normally talk about. It's a lot less hard science and, and information facts and a lot more kind of um, holding a mirror to society and talking about, you know, how how we can communicate ideas and, and uh, things like of that nature. So I thought it was a lot of fun uh, to talk with her about it. Yeah, it totally was. And I think it it reflects back on you and I as well as people who are a affiliated with theater and dance and film and art and things like that. And also as people who are science communicators, this is totally, totally our, our wheelhouse, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, we're, we're always looking for new and interesting and fascinating ways that we can communicate science or looking to see what other people are doing to communicate this sort of science. And I think climate science especially is, mm -hmm is, I don't want to say tricky, but maybe tricky. It's, it's, you it's know, more divisive. Exactly. Yeah. I don't, you know, I don't go into a show and tell somebody there's 79 moons around Jupiter and nobody fights me on that. No, there's not. <laughs> How dare you? <laughs> yeah. You know, occasionally I've had like a fourth grader or something that wants to correct me on things and sometimes they're right and that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, generally as Astronomy is not so much a, a divisive topic like something like climate change, which mm. I don't, you know, me personally, I don't understand what's divisive about climate change. I think it's pretty, it's pretty obvious the science is there, but I don't know. It's, it's, I guess it's politicized mm. more than other sciences are. Well, and I think unlike, you know, things like astronomy or physics, other than like the cool tech that we can kind of steal from the science that is done, Climate science has more implications for how and what humans can do, you know, as far as like, oh, you know, one of the examples we talked about was it's fun to ride on, fast on a fossil fuel powered motorcycle, right? And Which is I, true. You know, I, right. And I think perhaps, you know, people kind of feel kind of afraid or threatened when, when we talk about, you know, futures where this isn't really part of, of human life. And so, um, you know, it, it, I think it, it makes sense that it's more divisive than a, uh, a subject like astronomy where it's for the most part it's just researchers you know being nerds and and doing what we love to do right so yeah. one of the things we talked about that i found interesting was um you know using performance to kind of uh target the emotional response to the discussion on climate science rather than just providing information which is and i mentioned you know a lot of the time at fisk when when i give shows and stuff um, I try to, to, you know, invoke that emotional response, but a lot of it is, is, is providing information, hopefully in a fun, maybe comical way that is engaging, but nonetheless, it's information. And, uh, you know, I remember, for example, Dr. John Michael Keller, director of Fisk Planetarium, his, uh, his, what was it, uh, uh, graduate capstone, I don't know what the right word for that is, was a show at, to be performed at Fisk. It was like a theatrical show. I forget what it was called. Um, but that was another example of this. It's in space. Perfect. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I think it's tough to because, say it just like that. Yeah, you have to. Otherwise, you know, what are you doing? Uh, I think it's it's tough because a lot of this requires a lot more time and resources to prepare. Right, putting up a show is you know a full production is is much more involved than than one presenter giving a show at the planetarium. So sure. And it's, it's actually becoming much more of a talked about thing in science. Even I've noticed over the last like three years that I've been actually 
doing professional science is that it's communication and sharing is becoming a huge thing that everybody's talking about. And I think part of it is because it is such an emotional thing for us as scientists. We are very emotionally attached totally. to the science that we're doing. And so to be able to communicate that and sh be able to form that connection with someone else is what really makes you feel effective, I guess. Mm -hmm. You know, because I can be super excited about a crater somewhere, but trying to get a seventh grader really excited about craters, like if I could do that, my my life would be set. I would yeah, be, yeah. I could retire, I could be done right there <laughs> just to share that emotional yep. connection yep. with the science. You know, one of my saddest days at Fisk, this was, I don't know, probably six months into my job there was I was doing a, uh, it was a, I believe a fifth or sixth grade might have even been middle school, yikes, uh, uh, lights and lasers uh, lab in the dome. And, you know, we were in the middle of the shining the laser into the tank, right, and, and seeing um, how, how it would like light up and we would pull the plug and watch uh, the, the refraction, you know, of the laser kind of through the, the stream of water. And after we finished that, which is usually for the, for the listeners, that's a lot of people's favorite part. That's a very cool demonstration that we do. And afterwards, one of the kids in this class uh, in this class asked, so when are we going to get to the cool stuff? And I was like, I have failed as an educator. If that was not cool, then I did not do my job. And that was very upsetting. So I, uh, that's very true. To get people excited about what excites you seems to be really one of the primary goals of, of science communication. It took me a good... I don't know, a few months to um, get to the point where I didn't feel personally insulted if someone fell asleep in the planetarium yeah. Yeah. <laughs> during a yeah. show. Mm -hmm. Eventually you realize it's not your fault. It's just dark and quiet it's and comfy. comfortable. Yeah, totally, totally. <laughs> you know, but hearing, hearing a really loud snore, right? At like this really emotionally invested part of your show is <laughs> a little disappointing sometimes. Yep, yep. you're like, all right, cool, but yeah. 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 Well, um, darn, I, I had an idea just now and then it left me because my attention is terrible. I forget what oh. that was. Maybe that's a good time for us to move into our interview. Hey, maybe it is. What a great segue. What are segues? And now we'll talk to Dr. Beth Osnes. All right, so today we are talking with Dr. Beth Osnes, who's a CU professor. She combines a passion for environmental and climate science with a profession in theater and dance. Osnes is co-founder and co-director of Inside the Greenhouse, an endowed initiative at CU Boulder to celebrate creative climate communication through film, theater, dance, and music. Her original musical, Shine, weaves together climate science and performance art into a fun and powerful story which spans 300 million years of geological time to convey how humanity and energy and climate are all interrelated. So thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Osnes. Thank you for having me. We're super excited to talk to you. So aside from that whole bio that we just read there, can you tell us a little more about your background? Like what kind of education did you have? What programs at CU are you involved with? That sort of thing. Great. I think I'd start with myself. I'm the youngest of 10 kids. So I had nieces and nephews by the time I was six years old. I started getting nieces and nephews. And I began being the Pied Piper of the family and putting on shows and performances in, you know, really making serious damage of a basement with all the costumes and settings that you can imagine. And I remember my mom at one point, you know, not that long ago saying, you're just doing the same thing now, but you're like, doing it in ways that people think you're a grown up. And it's very true that I feel like it's an extension of just really relying on a relationship with young people and seeing them, you know, there was a time when I was a kid that with such a big family, I was often relegated to the kids table whenever there were family gatherings. And there was this time at which I graduated to the adult table and I got to sit with the adults. And I quickly realized, how dull it was to sit with the adults, that they told the same stories again and again, that there wasn't this much play. And I realized that I actually preferred a seat at the kids' table, not because I think they're cute or in these like reductive, stupid ways that people talk about kids, but because they're actually a little bit more interesting and they're in touch with play and imagination and new stories. They're not so invested in the old ones. And I feel like that's really informed and 
really still is what my career is trying to do. I don't go with kids because I think they're cute or worthy or precious. I do it because they're good partners. Well, great. That was a, a, a very nice introduction to, to how it is you ended up here, uh, you know, doing uh, performance and, and working with uh, youth. And so I'm kind of to start talking about one of these examples of this work. Um, you work on something called Inside the Greenhouse. So I'll ask you really quick, could you, could you describe what that is? And also, I'd like to ask what inspired you to start working on Inside the Greenhouse? Great. So I've always been more of, a, of an activist than somebody who wanted to be a performer and be like the star of the show. That's never really held a whole lot of interest for me. I've always been more interested in creating kind of performance experiences that have a social impact in a community and with people and on issues of, that I really deemed important. So as a professor at the University of Colorado, I started partnering with and working with people who were working on clean energy initiatives, and then that brought me to a meeting that Jim White, who's now our Dean of Arts and Sciences, was co-leading with Marta Kern, who runs Eco Arts Connections. And it was on how we can use the arts to advance climate change. And I, at this meeting, I was sitting across the table from uh, another professor in environmental studies, Max Boykoff. And he and I just kind of hit it off and got this into this conversation about how we wanted to like co-produce produce this like this kind of show or like all these different ideas that we had for how we wanted to get this message, like communicate climate in these creative ways that were not the standard forms that you would imagine. And so he and I really joined forces in this and started looking at doing it. And then we, we, we also were um, united with Becca Safran, who's in evolutionary biology and who's really a leading scientist in this field. And she was doing a class on, um, climate change in film, really looking at how do we tell the story from these kind of personally, inv personally invested ways. So it made a natural kind of coming together. And it was, the thing that's so cool about it is that it really formed what Inside the Greenhouse is. And then later we joined in with Phaedra Pizzullo from Communication. But what it really does is it brings this really solid foundation of scientific information. So we're really basing this, these creative climate communications on the best of the available science. And then we're using the social sciences to inform us in what makes for effective climate communication and using Pedro Pizzullo's you know, communication skills. And then really coming to the arts for expression of these climate communications in these multimodal you know, ways that can just, you know, it's like that can, can just tell these stories in new unconventional different ways that might catch people's um, attention in different ways and might also go around these kind of already established fences and blocks to climate messaging. Like I'm done, I've heard this message, I'm done. And these ways that may not be verbal, that may just be visual, may kind of come in and engage in ways that don't put people's backs against the wall so that we have a chance to unite about, to come together in what unites us, maybe above what divides us. So I'm curious, you know, in, the, in this discussion, it sounds like, you know, there was kind of this, this push to how can we uh, connect with with you know viewers in this case because it's it's a performance uh, or you know the audience in a way that doesn't you know like you said that kind of goes around uh, you know pre-established fences and and you know you're kind of informing this work with the social science that you know might suggest ways to connect with your audience uh, in such a way that they are more open to hearing the message what are some of those ways how you know what sorts of things do you avoid? What do you encourage uh, with this kind of work? Oh, that's a good question. Um, some of the ways that we do it is to just, I like to go towards things that where the artistic medium is integral with what you're actually trying to do. So one of the forms that we've, that I've experimented with, and it's based in, excuse me, in work that I did as a Fulbright scholar in Malaysia on the traditional shadow puppet theater of Southeast Asia, which is this really beautiful form of shadow puppet theater that's done at night. And it's, um, it's for the whole community. It has like every age, it's not segregated in terms of, you know, age in terms of the audience. And it has this holistic thing. It can cure cholera and it can entertain after a good rice harvest. You know, it's like, it's a holistic kind of total theater that I'm really interested in. So using the, having done that research on this, Asian you know, performance form back in the 90, early 90s, 
And now doing this work on clean energy, I've started, one of the forums I've used is the solar powered shadow puppet theater, where in the Navajo Nation um, at Thoreau High School in the Eastern Agency, I partnered with a school in using solar powered shadow puppet theater for the students to create these characters that were stakeholders in different energy, like ideas that they identified within their own community. Like, hey, let's, let's put up a solar park, you know, like a solar farm park somewhere in our area. And then, okay, well, who are the stakeholders in this idea? Well, there's the coal plants, which you could anthropomorphize. So there's like a character, a shadow puppet character that is coal. And then you could have, you know, voice of the children, which is this, you know, shadow puppet of children. And you can get a lot of comedy out of this. And you can also take students who might be shy to perform in a science class who are hiding behind a screen because that's how you do shadow puppet theater. And they're so much more animated when they're using a puppet instead of, um, you know, being in front of people where you might be more self-conscious. And the mechanisms of production are so needy that you just kind of lose your self-consciousness because you're having to attend to what you're doing. And also the light that is the shining light that is coming towards the screen and capturing those shadows of the puppets is a solar powered light. So the kids are actually, the young people are actually touching, working with, charging the solar powered light that they're using for creating the shadow puppet theater. And there's this kind of integrity of production that it's with and for and about this idea of a clean energy future that youth are co-authoring. And so those are the kind of things that I'm really interested in is like, you know, and then with Shine, it's really interested in saying, how do we create a narrative framework that starts to tell this story with artistic excellence and imagination of like our relationship to fossil fuels within the last 300 years, 300 million years, and how our overuse of fossil fuels has begun to impact our climate. And how can we get ourselves to this point in history where, ah, that's true. And then how do we say to the young people who are the in the show to say, what ideas do you have for us to tell the new story, that next story from this moment now where these things are true to this future where we can find a balance and survive as a species and so that other species can survive too? How do we do that? And they co-author it with their local climate challenges and with their ingenuity and with the partners that they have available to them. So it's really providing these kind of narrative frameworks for supporting youth authorship of solutions. And then for them to share them out through performance, because I think people receive things through performance in different ways. There's joy, there's rhythm, there's music, there's visual delight, that there's this kind of opening that occurs with beauty and with music and movement that is different than this kind of, here's a flyer, here's a billboard, here's a one way thing, you know? So it's a different experience. I imagine it allows people to have more of maybe an emotional connection to the yeah. subject because, you know, theater, dance, music, that's all very emotionally driven art. And so yeah. I imagine that allows people to connect a little better with the message than, yeah, just here's a flyer or here, go read this paper or what have you. And it's also interesting because we make most of our big decisions that really influence our lives based on emotions. When my husband and I were looking to buy a house, we kind of walked through and went, I, I like the feel of this house, you know? That's a big decision. You're like cars, people are like, oh, I like the lines on that car. You know, what a ridiculous, you marry somebody based on your feelings about them. You don't do a cost benefit analysis on, you know, your potential partner. We make these big decisions based on feelings. So I think we make our big climate behavioral decisions and policy decisions based on feelings a lot too. And they should be informed by, backed up by logic, but acknowledging human behavior, it helps to acknowledge what's actually true about us as this weird species. Well, yeah, that seems, that is a very cool perspective because I think a lot of the time, you know, from Tara and I's perspective, you know, we do a lot of science communication, you know, where we just talk about the science, right? And, and science education. And a lot of the time that comes in the form of delivering information, right? Hopefully in a fun, engaging way, but more or less it's delivering information and then encouraging people to use that information to, you know, yeah. in, to, to inform their decisions. And I like the idea that, hey, humans are emotional people or beings, and, and <laughs> that's how our decision making, you know, is, is guided, right? And it, it's not always strictly locked in step with, with logic or information, you know? So that, yeah, that's a very cool way to, I think, 
engage with people, you know, beyond what the usual methods are. Yes. Yeah, they refer to this in social sciences, they'll talk about the deficit model of communication that people lack information and therefore that's why they're not making pro-environmental behavioral choices. And it's been proven again and again that it's actually a narrative, um, it's a transformable narrative that will actually help people make different choices. So can, in, ref, in reference to Shine, can you tell us a little more about how you put all of that information into this musical format and how you kind of integrate the research? And I was curious if, if this sort of format allows you to, um, you know, update things down the road as we get more information and more research is done and things like that. Yeah, definitely. So with Shine, I was really trying to wrestle with humanity's relationship with fossil fuels and our reliance upon fossil fuels. And it's, you know, really noticing that there's these two characters that are kind of like these two character sets within the play, mm -hmm. where one of them are these like these, this community of people who are living this more sustainable lifestyle that is, you know, that's really just using these kind of natural harvesting of this of the sun's energy, you know, like it's much more sustainable and, you know, really just relying on biomass, which is, you know, like, it's going to emit some carbon, but in very manageable ways. And then this idea of fossil fuels and the young people actually participate in the making with the sun of becoming these ancient plants and animals that then leave, die and get crushed by this, you know, thousands of pounds of, you know, of mud and rock and sands and become fossil fuels. And then fossil fuel emerging as a character who's like, yeah, he's got the more um, energy and he's like, you just can't even believe, like, I can like help humans who are toiling, like, I can do so much. And then the son's character saying, yeah, but be careful. We don't know what you can do. Like, well, let's figure it out. Let's, let's see what humans seem to like this, you know, like humans seem to like going fast on a motorcycle. Like it's fun to go on a ride on fossil fuels. And it really comes down to this kind of like clash. And then this kind of also finding some you know, ways that we are living together with these sustainable ways and with these fossil fuel based energy. So how do we kind of survive? So giving that story a form what was what I was trying to do in, in Shine and not demonize one or the other because we're seduced and we think both are fun and cool and we need to, we're, we're, we're going to be both of those things anyway. We're not going to give up completely this addiction to fossil fuels because you know, they, we rely upon them for pharmaceutical, and, you know, like everything is in bed. Like we're so entangled with fossil fuels. So to kind of bring that up in hopefully not so much of a demonizing good, bad, you know, way, moralistic way, but more of a like, how do we figure this out? And so this was a, a show that I first did and carried it around and to different communities around the world that were part of the Rockefeller Foundation's um, 100 Resilient Cities Initiative. I really did it in, in connection with them because these were communities that were already in the process of authoring a plan for resilience. And what I was hoping to do was ensure youth contributions to these plans through the, the use of this play in these different communities. And um, as a way of harvesting um, youth input into their local climate solutions. So then this next show that I'm working on now that I'm in the process of writing grants for and planning for is called, I don't know the name, it's either Swallowed Hole or Bird's Eye View. And it's about humanity's relationship with barn swallows primarily because um, humanity's um, migration across this planet as settler communities has gone with barn swallows. They followed us to all these different areas and they reside almost exclusively now in human made structures. So we share the story of expansion and settlement and all that that implies in terms of colonization and everything with this species, barn swallows. So we turn to the species to, in a spirit of interspecies friendship towards how do we author an equitable, survivable and thrivable future? And we, so I'm constructing this new musical that is very similar to Shine in format and that it tells a first story that act one that's professionally scripted composed by my partner, my Grammy winning partner, Tom Wassinger, who's just an incredible um, composer and has such humor and heart and skill. And um, working with him to create that first act that sets up this story of interspecies friendship with this group of young people who are doing this art science observation 
summer field work outside on these barn swallows slowly get kind of magically brought into this world, pulled into this world by the observations with these birds and their growing friendship until they're transformed through this magical portal into the world of the birds and through this perspective as birds transformed into birds that they um, then author local climate solutions based from this interspecies perspective towards all species survivability into the future. So that's the next musical that's coming and it carries that same similar um, idea that it's like you bring young people into this feeling and experience of artistic excellence and hope that that carries over into um, their authorship. And then there's a final musical number at the end that pulls the whole thing together and celebrates it and makes it kind of toe tapping and humming into the future. So, you know, we've talked a lot about these different uh, uses of performance in theater, uh, you know, to communicate these ideas and to give a voice to the people that are putting these performances on, right, in their communities mm -hmm. and to the young people themselves. I'm curious, have you ever come across any sort of, uh, I, I want to say like criticism or, or backlash for trying to use this um, method to communicate, you know, ideas as, as big as climate change? Uh, or is it or is it all positive? Are people generally happy with? Well, I think work? I haven't really come across negative. Like, don't be silly with climate change; it's too serious. Like, nobody's really said that. But I think the extent to which people haven't embraced youth contributions through theater as seriously as I might like is something that is still a growing um, area of challenge for me. And part of that is being that bridge builder, doing strategic partnerships. Um, there are certain places where I feel like it really succeeded. Like in Boulder, because I'm most embedded in Boulder, we were really able to do a performance of Shine at the Sustainability Energy Environment Complex at the CU campus, where we had leaders, like civic leaders from our community there, partnering with the young people in, in creating those skits that were the Act Two solutions. And, you know, we had Nobel Prize winning Eric Cornell, physics, you know, he was one of the people partnering with, you know, senior environmental planners with the city of Boulder who are really authoring our climate action mobilization plan. We're there collaborating with the youth. So it's like, that was a really great, you know, leading um, kind of NGOs and community orgs that were um, represented at that event. And then, you know, in the city of Boulder, our, our resilience plan that we authored that was part of our 100 Resilient Cities Initiative, you know, one of the outcomes that was expected was this plan for resilience. And the shine was included in that actual plan for resilience. But that's the only city where it was really actually included in the plan for resilience formally. So it's like, you know, that goal of having had it more included formally throughout, you know, I traveled to over, I think it ended up being like nine communities in total where the performance was mounted. So, you know, that didn't fully get all the way, like even though it, it certainly reached people within the community, that formal like integration of youth through theatrical methods into an official plan is still a challenge, an ongoing challenge to get that legitimacy for arts-based methods, to get that legitimacy of, uh, of authorship by youth. That's still, and that's still like, I got my work cut out for me. I have good job security because that still has, you know, that still could use some work. So you mentioned you were, uh, Shine was being performed at these, uh, these Rockefeller cities, I guess we said, mm -hmm. um, places that were already kind of implementing some sort of climate change work being done in their communities. Um, is this being promoted to maybe the opposite group, these people who are very resistant to promoting climate change in their community. Are we trying to reach out to these people too? Because it seems like this would be a great medium to at least get a conversation started. Yeah, that's great. So now it's really like, you know, it was really within the 100 Resilient Cities Initiative, it was me taking them to different cities. You know, it's like, it's hard to get a catch. Like it wasn't like it was so successful that it caught on that everybody was doing one of these. Um, truth be told, it was me taking them to these different communities around the world and producing it and partnering and, you know, pushing it uphill and celebrating it and judging it. Um, but I think that in terms of, you know, within my own scope of what I can do as one person, the, the communicating of climate as a debate to try to convince people that climate change is real is like, I could spend the better part of my life and not succeed in that way 
So I don't know what the point is really. It's like, I'm just interested in creating a better party that says, hey, how about with folks who are the already, already ready to do something, but don't quite know what to do to make a difference. It just takes, it's such a better use of my energy. And it's like, I'm not somebody who loves conflict. I don't love conflict. I'd rather work with the people who want to like, they want to do it. And that's more, I think it's going to be a better use for it. I don't think that, um, you know, the thing that's great about being in schools is you get a bipartisan group of folks, like you get their kids. And when we did this at Stober Elementary in, I don't know if it's Golden or Lakewood where the school is, but it's in one of those areas over in Jeffco. We did this show at, at Stober Elementary. And it was great because one of the parents was an energy engineer working at um, in extraction of fossil fuels. And she said, you know, I want to come in and talk to the kids about coal and oil. And like, I want to, I want to get in there and talk to them too. So it was great. She came in and gave a talk to the kids, the fourth and fifth graders who were involved in doing the show. And then when we did the performance on Earth Day as an all school assembly, all the parents came and I'm kind of like going, hmm, I wonder how this is going to go down. <laughs> and it was great. You know, the kids, the parents are grateful. They were kind of in on it. And so it's like, I think that by being in schools, you can strategically reach a bipartisan audience and kind of like it brings together, you know, we all are shared values of our kids and their future. It's kind of undeniable. So when authored by the kids, that's kind of a strategic um, method and approach to communicating climate because it's kind of undeniable that the stabilizing of the climate is towards their best interest. That's not really a political thing to say. That's not like, oh, I'm being so biased. You know, that's kind of like, you can't really argue with science. You know, like I love what I've heard many scientists say, Jim White says it so beautifully. Like, it's like, you can sneak, you can be sneaky, you can get away with things and you can argue, but you really just can't argue with or be sneaky with scientific rules. Like you put so much carbon and other greenhouse gases into the atmosphere and there will be certain consequences. You can't sneak around and get away with it. That's just going to be like, that's a cause and effect situation. So I'm curious, you know, that's really interesting, you know, basically giving the kids the power to write this show. And then of course, you know, their parents are going to, you know, eat that up, right? It's their kids. They put this on. I wonder if anyone has ever said, hey, Dr. Osnes, you're indoctrinating my kids. You're teaching them things that I don't like you to teach them. And they're, now they think this and it's wrong. Have you ever faced any sort of, you know? <laughs> uh, I haven't directly, but I say, bring it on because the education they have received is so biased and so in bed with the status quo that I say, bring it on. Let's have that conversation. I'm ready. Let's have nice. that. Nice, good, good. Wow, that, you know, I'm, I guess I'm, I'm, that's good to hear that that hasn't happened, you know, because I, I guess that shows that, hey, parents are, are open to this, right? They're, they're not. Well, know, and it's also first. like a, you know, a selection bias because the schools mm. were like, oh yeah, let's do this are the schools and the teachers who are right. up for it. And it doesn't mean that there aren't individual parents, but by then there's already such a momentum that they can feel, you know, so there is that thing like, you know, the next thing that I'm working on, I'm really seeking to get it more distribution through these, like there's Music Theater International is a distribution platform for musicals and like Disney style musicals. And I don't know how old you all are, but like, going through like middle and high school. There's like, you know, every year you put on a musical, the, the school does, or many schools do. And at a cost, a pretty high cost, you can rent these Disney musicals in a can and you get all the costumes and it's super fun. And um, these things are like, you know, disseminated. And so we're seeking to create this alternative product that they can use, which is a musical that supports youth authorship of climate solutions that's just as fun, that has just as many toe tapping numbers, that has dance numbers, that has, that it's like well supported. There's like things in a can, like there's a show kit that supports educators in easily mounting these shows. So that's what this next format is seeking to do is to get into this distribution channel that is um, already supplying musicals for middle schools and high schools. And I wanna do a lower cost, lower to no cost alternative that does something more meaningful and that doesn't potentially 
reinscribe these values that I think are at the root cause of climate change, which are dominating, you know, patriarchal values and, you know, old tropes, the old status quo that is what got us into this pickle in the first place. So with these larger distribution networks, right, it's funny you bring this up, you know, I, I, one of my favorite things was to play these shows in high school, I play key, I play piano and I would play keys and yeah, great. Uh, it was always, a, it was always a fun day when the scores and the materials came in, right, you could start yeah. working on it. Yeah. Uh, I, and one of the things I wonder, you know, about these, there's, there's, uh, as far as I can tell, you know, these four large, you know, main publishers of these shows that high schools typically rent from, and, and community and professional theaters. And to do a low cost show, but still go through one of these large distribution networks, is that, is there something weird going on there? Like, I feel like that's, it's like akin to trying to get a book published in, at a, under a huge publisher and say, but I want this to be, I want this to only cost a dollar for anyone to buy it. But it's like a textbook, but I want okay, it to cost a no. dollar. You know, do they, are they weird about no. that? Do they say, no, if you want to use our network, it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to cost a lot of money. <laughs> Well, this is where, this is what I'm entering into right now. And I think it likens to, you know, at the University of Colorado, I just won an open educational resource award as an educator seeking to highlight and create and use open educational resources, which is this revolution that is making accessible the information that comes from the university. So these artistic products like books and things like, and articles and academic articles, they get created largely on public funds and grants and things like that. Like, you know, who's funding us? I mean, we don't get that much money from the state, but still, you know, these ideas of these public institutions that hold the common good at their heart and making the, the, the products of the, the knowledge, the, the um, resources open source. So this is gonna, of course it will land in resistance and bring it on. Like, let's, let's transform this so that it's accessible. And we'll be creative in it. And it might be thwarted in some ways and we'll find another way. Like the water wants to go downhill. It doesn't get to go in one river, it diverts and it finds another. So that will be the journey to come. And I'm also working with CLEAN, which is the um, Climate Literacy Energy Awareness Network that is funded by NOAA and um, uh, the Department of Energy, NASA, and our own series here at University of Colorado, the Center for yeah, series, the Center for, um, oh, what does it stand for? The, yeah, the, the um, Coll Collaborative Institute for the Study of Environmental Science. Yeah, no, series, Collaborative Institute for Research in Environmental Science. There, there you go. Whew. And um, we oversee this thing called the Clean Network, and it's a distribution channel through our government for climate educational resources. That so I've already the Shine the musical that I already created is already has been peer reviewed and is featured on the Clean Network. So that's another avenue that I will certainly go again that I already kind of did and know how to do and had success with. So I'll certainly build on that success. But I also want to get into more. This next effort really represents me trying to get go into the other route that you were talking about more about like the routes that most high schools are actually using which are these more theatrical distribution outlets. So I, we've talked a, a bit about this, this show, Shine. And uh, I would like to ask, so you know, from, the, from your book, by the way, listeners, uh, Dr. Osnes has authored several books, so check these out. But from one of them, um, and I'm quoting here, the first half of Shine is professionally scripted, composed, and choreographed to convey how our use of fossil fuels is impacting our climate. The second half, our future story, is authored by local youth to generate solutions from their city's resilience, for their city's resilience, excuse me. In rehearsing the musical, participants themselves embody aspects of climate science and human development, end quote. So, so you know, and we talked about this first act is, seems to be consistent across performances. That is, it is mm -hmm. the first act yeah, and, and that you just, you just learn it like a normal show, like you normally would. The second act, right, is informed by, by the, the, the kids mm -hmm. that are doing the show. How, in what ways do this, does the second act differ? Is there a scaffolding in place to, to you know, start people off or is it really a blank slate and it completely gets written and is entirely different for every different show that goes up? Great, so the solutions and the content is completely different, but then there's a scaffolded um, support for educators for creating um, 
for you know leading youth in creating these skits because it's not such an easy thing to just say to young people go create a skit you know so that doesn't really work so we really i really this is really what i like doing this is my main thing i do is create these kind of situations or create these frameworks or templates for people to support young people in being creative and being expressive in effective ways so one way that like if you don't have that much time to um mount this musical or have the youth authored things. One of the things I would do is, here's an example, I would say like for the three of us, if we came up with a solution, the three of us are a group and we're like, okay, oh, this is a cool solution. Let's do a solution whereby um, we have every street sign in Boulder has to have those um, panels for solar and that we have like, we've already installed like battery packs so that they can have windshield wipers if snow builds up so that there's a reliability of solar energy powering all of our stop signs, you know, like stoplights in Boulder. That's our solution. And so then we would say, okay, let's all of us make a statue or like a moving statue of that solution. So, you know, like maybe um, Colin and I would be the, he would be the stop sign and I would be the thing and then I would be the thing. And then we would, then we would have, Tara would be the narrator of this statue. And that's a really quick, easy way to get young people physical, and creative and telling a story about their solutions. But you can do that in like 40 minutes with a group of young people. Like it doesn't take that long to scaffold them in doing that. And then if you've got more time, like when I did a residency at the University of East London and then worked with a school in East London, uh, took these college students and we went into the school and did an artist in residence in the school, we had a longer time to be supporting the creation of these skits. So they were much more developed and they had more of a story arc. And, you know, so there's a range in how these can be done and yet it still works. It's still supporting youth authored solutions. And then at the end, there was still the final number, which was the shine, shine, shine number, which was a shine, 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 shine. And everybody's dancing and singing. And there's this kind of like memorable song at the end, which human communities have used forever as a way of cementing a public experience together to solidify and deepen and you know absorb the content and the message of a collective event so that's the kind of the range that you can do you can have these different kind of and the thing that is in the design too i in the first play shine i partnered with arthur frederick who is a former Broadway performer, and he worked with Jerome Robbins. He was um, action in West Side Story when Jerome Robbins choreographed it on Broadway. And he now works with the National Dance Institute. And he's just a master. The National Dance Institute is a organization throughout New York City and all the burgs that um, brings artistic excellence, dance, into these places where kids of every neighborhood get to experience excellence in dance through their bodies. And he has this belief and this kind of premise that, that kids gain a lot of self-respect by experiencing artistic excellence through their bodies. And that it can just go so far in, in validating kids in feeling like they've got this kind of, that they embody this kind of excellence. And so really the, the design of this is so that first act instills within them and, and immerses them in this experience of artistic excellence so that and also this kind of scientific excellence because shine was developed with very closely with scientific experts josh Rollin, josh sperling who's a scientist with nrail the national um center for renewable energy and um patty romero who was a, a social scientist at the national lab for renewable energy at no the national center for atmospheric research at nrail ncar and so, and, you know, Jim White was one of our scientific advisors. So we really used the, the best of scientific and artistic excellence in that act one so that young people would then carry that over into their own solutions. So they would bring forth that same level of excellence into their own authorship of solutions. So I think we've kind of talked around this question a little bit so far, but what is it that really drives your passion for engaging young people, especially with this issue of energy and climate change? Okay, great. What is it that does that? Um, well, I just feel like it's kind of like, it's kind of cheating them if they don't get to have a voice in it. Like 
they're the ones who are going to inherit it. Like I might just, I'm old enough that I might just kind of skirt through this and I might die of old age. It's kind of okay. But it's just a sense, a very strong sense of intergenerational environmental justice that drives me. It's not fair. It's not fair that you don't get to have that same access to wild, beautiful natural spaces, that you don't get access to clean air and clean water and a dignified life that is free from pain and extreme suffering and that you don't have resource wars plaguing your future. I don't want that for the next generation. I have kids. I don't even care that they're just my kids, other kids too, you know? I don't want that. I don't want to, I don't want that not on my watch. I don't want that to be my legacy. I don't want that to be the result of how I lived. So I think that's really what I was born extremely earnest and I remain earnest. And that's really what drives me is intergenerational environmental justice. So taking that passion and then applying it to today's world where the COVID-19 pandemic has kind of halted, uh, well, lots of things, but one of those being, you know, putting kids together in a theater and letting them put up a show, right? Pretty much all theater has been stopped because it's, it's not really safe right now. So I'm curious, how do you continue to nurture resilience and, uh, and empower youth both now when, when a lot of these in-person uh, performances and gatherings are, are uh, restricted and, and uh, unsafe, and how will you, you know, kind of continue to do this, uh, you know, as the future comes, as we start to move past the pandemic? Well, it's interesting. In this work that I've been doing deeply with Inside the Greenhouse, this next project that I've been talking about that I'm calling either side-by-side, -side, it's like side-by-side -side project, art science hybrid research, and on these birds, this focus on birds and that story that I was sharing with you, that we didn't lose any time. We had a full on session this summer with a group of youth, young women in Boulder, where we um, did um, observation of a population of barn swallows that reside under Discovery Drive, which is on East Campus. And it's this boring looking little cement bridge that there's a bike path that goes under it. And you would just drive your bike under it and just think nothing of it. And yet we went there over the summer and did art and science field notes on this population of barn swallows. And we did it wearing masks at six feet separated, social distancing, meeting there many mornings over the summer. And when you stop and kind of queer time where it slows down and really settle into this space, this incredible ecosystem emerges where you realize that there's this, there's this creek that goes under that bridge next to the bike path. There's like a kind of a little pond at one end and a pond at the other that's small. And there's cranes that come in. There's a red-winged blackbird that gets so mad at that crane because it gets too close to the heron, excuse me, the heron, because the heron keeps getting too close to its nest. And she gets so mad and she is around the heron and the heron's like a little oblivious. I'm like, what? I don't get it. And then meanwhile, the barn swallows are shoo, flying around, getting bugs in their beaks. And then we learn because I'm partnering with Becca Safran, who's a scientist, that they're actually they have a beak that's wide enough on the bottom where they're actually collecting multiple bugs in their beak at one point. And then they go back to their, their babies and their babies actually have like little yellow mouths so that you can aim better. Like, you know, like if you're gonna get the bugs into their mouths, you can aim better and you're putting them into their mouths and you can see this happening. Like through our observations, we could observe this happening and we could gain this feeling of interspecies friendship with this population and this feeling of connection and this growing sense of belonging to this, this human built phenomenon because that happened because of the human built environment. Without that, there wouldn't be those barn swallows there. They rely on that. So we've got an entanglement of existence of, of ecosystems that are right in our neighborhoods that these kids can ride their bikes to. We're not even relying on fossil fuels to get them there. They're riding their bikes to all gather at this research site. And we did this over the summer. And then we met on my mm. niece's farm, which is right on open space over on like, um, in, like in Longmont. And we, with the Rocky Mountains as our background and open space behind us, we did this filming of them having taken these observations and then putting them into 
we co-created all these huge puppets of different birds made out of recycled materials and things that were found. And so we did this huge recording session of them moving and bringing in their poetry that they had written at this site and created this video that is really beautiful of their work. And that really informs and um, feeds into this creation of this next musical that will be made. So I think that once you get kids outside, and I mean, the research shows that getting outside, that that is actually feeding the well-being of young people. And they also like Robin Wall Kimmerer, who is an indigenous biologist, she talks about this idea of species loneliness, that we have this loneliness that sets in when we feel separated. That's why we feel so fed by our relationships with our cats and our dogs and the birds that come by our outside windows. And like mm -hmm. that by finding these places of connection and feelings of belonging, we actually bring ourselves into this post-humanistic view of ourselves as not having dominion over nature, but being a part of, which actually feels better. The responsibility is shared. The the feeling of communion is gained. So this next, this next um, musical that I'm working on is really bringing forth and supporting an experience of that with young people. So we really haven't been slowed down at all by COVID because we wanna be outside to do it anyway. So for any of our listeners who are out there, I know we have education professionals that like to listen to our podcast. If they wanted to uh, bring shine to their local school or group or Girl Scouts, how would they do that? Well, they could go to the Clean Network, which, um, or they could just come to insidethegreenhouse.org, which is our website. And um, there you could go to the How to Act Up, and then there's a little thing that says Shine. And on the website there, there is everything you need to put up the musical Shine. There's a professionally produced um, video of the whole show. There is um, the scripts. All of this is open source. There's the scripts, there's the, you know, the music with and without lyrics that you can just use open source in the doing of it. There's choreographic notes, there's videos for, if you wanna do the choreography created by Arthur Frederick for each one of the numbers. So it's all there, even instructions for creating the simple costumes as well as my contact info. If anybody needs support or just encouragement, I am here and they can even borrow costumes that we've already got, yeah. We're here to help support this happening. I don't know that I've ever seen a show that would be so easy to get materials for. That's pretty fantastic. Yes. That you can go to the website and boom, they're there. Take they're there. Break. Yeah, that's awesome. So uh, we like to do a little uh, Q and A session. We call it Capcom Q and A. It's a little play on <laughs> space mm -hmm. uh, exploration science, and uh, you know we have a question uh, that I'd like to pose to you. Uh, this is from Charlotte in Austin, who's asking, what practical steps can we take in our daily lives to impact climate change? Great. So I think it's really great. We partner a lot with um, Project Drawdown, which is an organization that really brought together so many different scientists and social scientists to make a list of the top climate solutions and what kind of an impact we can have, which they can have in reversing global warming and creating that sense of drawdown where the we're taking down more than we're putting up. And um, the top solutions are surprising. You know, like talk about sex education, talk about family planning, talk about access to family planning methods. That's one of the top things that you can do. Um, support the education of young women who will then, especially worldwide, who will then marry later, um, defer um, child rearing, and they'll usually have less children when when they have access to more education. Take a really good look at what you're eating, like increase how many plant, your plant rich diet. You don't have to go cold turkey. You don't have to be a vegan. You don't have to cross over and think, oh, I can't do that. Just reduce, just increase the amount of enjoyment you have in a plant-based diet. Work to reduce food waste. Um, that's a huge one as well. If you just even take on your own food consumption and start looking at who and what you're supporting in terms of what kind of packaging, what kind of refrigeration needs for the food you're buying. What are you supporting? How are you supporting local slow food and um, locally resourced food? Doing those things and putting a little bit more money into less higher quality food can really be a big part in creating this revolution. But those things, you know, like 
you don't like you, great if you can put solar panels on your rooftop fantastic but you can do so much more with your diet it's actually ranked higher in the drawdown list as having a higher impact than solar distributed and utility scale so food is where it's at and family planning and education for young women well it's kind of cool too it seems like all of these things are are as you've been talking about this whole time you know it's it's all related to to health and well-being you know i mean if you increase you know your enjoyment for a plant-based diet you're you're both you know helping uh, uh, positively contribute to climate change and you're going to be healthier because of it you know so which uh, i think is a really nifty uh, win-win for everyone so this is one of my favorite comics shows a um these two people talking at a climate conference and there's a board, there's a PowerPoint thing up on the projector and it says all the, it lists all the co-benefits of climate change where it's like, you know, re, you know, like more pristine saving of resources, like all these, all these co-benefits to climate change. And then the one scientist is saying to the other, what if we make, what if we go ahead and reverse global warming and make the world a better place. And this is all a hoax. <laughs> climate, what if climate change is a hoax and we make the, the world a better place for nothing? You know, it's like, even if climate change is a hoax, working towards it actually has so many co benefits that you'd want all those things anyway. That's great. Yeah, that's brilliant. Well, you know, I heard a similar uh, joke a while back about wearing masks. Like, hey, you know, what if it comes out that mask wearing isn't, isn't helping anyone, you know, and then, and, you know, for COVID wise, at least, you know, and then the response yeah. is, well, great, but I was, it didn't bother me. And I was trying to help other people. So shame on me. And uh, <laughs> here we are, everything's fine. You know, yeah, that's so. right. Perfect. Well, uh, Dr. Beth Osnes, I think that that, a wrap, that about wraps up the time that we have today. Uh, I'd like to say thanks again so much for being on the show. It was such a pleasure to talk with you. Thank you so much for, you guys are doing great work. What a delight to talk with you. All right, everyone, that was our interview with Dr. Beth Osnes. Super cool to talk to her. We want to thank her again for joining us. That was really fun. Uh, be sure to come back next week. We're going to be talking to another scientist slash communicator, Dr. Kachun Yu, who works at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. He helps uh, put together their space exhibits and their planetarium shows. And he's going to tell us a bit about what goes into creating a museum exhibit to entice and excite children of all ages from 9 to 99 or what have you. Uh, be sure to check out our website as well, the colorado.edu slash FISC. That's where you can find a schedule of all of our upcoming shows, topics, and guests. There's also an option there for you to submit your questions for our Capcom Q&A section. So you can drop some questions in there for our experts and we'll pass those along for you. You can also use the website to uh, donate if you would like to help contribute to the recording of this podcast and help us keep on going into the future. We would love support from viewers like you. Uh, as always, you can find our podcast on YouTube, SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify. Be sure to like and comment and subscribe and do all of those fun things so you don't miss any of our upcoming episodes. And thank you so much for listening. We hope to see you again next week. Mm -hmm.